Hi, welcome to Stand With Us. I'm Roz Rothstein, CEO and co-founder of the organization Stand With Us, which is a education organization about Israel. Today we're going to be talking about Israeli heroes in Haiti. And our guest is photojournalist Joe Shalmoni, who's been a photographer all his life and decided he was going to go to Haiti on, in January of 2010 when Haiti experienced a 7.0 earthquake and was devastated. Uh, the reason you wanted to go, I understand, is, well, why don't you tell us, Joe, why did you want to go to Haiti? Thank you. Good morning, Roz. Good morning. I was uh, excited when I heard that the Israelis had sent a crew to Haiti, and within 16 hours after the earthquake, the, they were already in the air, or perhaps less even. And by the 15th, they had a hospital. They had their first members of the delegation there and had set up and erected a hospital in 10 hours. It was done in MASH style setup. So it was outdoors with tents. And I was impressed by hearing all this. And I knew there was quite a story there. And I'm very passionate about photojournalism. So I knew I definitely wanted to go and cover this. And, and when you got there, I don't know what kind of a difficult trip it was, but when you got to to Haiti, what was it like? Well, you know, walk us through what it was like when you landed and how you ended up getting to the Israeli field hospital. Sure. We, we overnighted in the Dominican Republic, which Haiti shares uh, with on the island of Hispaniola. And then the next day, after trials and tribulations, we found a charter flight to take us into the Port-au-Prince airport. Getting into Port-au-Prince, I found a tremendous melee of people large numbers of people, families, without any documents or luggage, just trying to get into the airport to escape what was going on in Haiti. I actually had to climb over people and pull my luggage just to get onto the main street. When I finally got there, <coughs> pardon me, with the uh, young lady that I was traveling with, uh, who was from the IDF, I looked around and after a few minutes I saw a truck drive by with an Israeli flag and that was my introduction to the presence of the Israelis in Port-au-Prince and eventually with the help of some people from another Haitian aid organization we made our way to the Israeli base. Okay, so now you get to the Israeli base. What was that like for you? Was it what you expected it to be? Was it bigger? I mean everybody really was talking about it. They were set up like that. What, what exactly did you see? I saw a very well-established infrastructure that reflected clearly the preparation of its director, medical director, Dr. Ofer Marim, that showed they had prepared well in advance to set up a hospital quickly with 30 large tents, 500 mattresses, 200 beds, over 1,100 blankets, several departments, many of which you would liken and compare to a regular hospital, a pediatric ward, intensive care, an emergency room, a triage area. There was uh, two operating suites. There was a director of, senior director of uh, nursing that would prepare all the equipment for the, the surgeries. They treated 1,110 patients produced uh, 319 successful surgeries and were designed so that they were capable of treating 60 patients at any one time and could do up to 500 patients a day. And when they came, they had basically what I would say was a very well-established oasis in a heart of melee. It was done on a, uh, on a soccer field and it was fenced and guarded by the Israeli military as well. And when they arrived, they, they came to give and were facing over several hundred thousand patients that needed care. So you, you mentioned security. I mean, we, we saw on television, we were watching that unfortunately, as with all catastrophes like this, we see uh, rioting begin and problems that are a side effect of a big catastrophe like this. Did you see some of that? Is that why the Israelis needed the security, or were they prepared for security because they do that anyways? Are they always worried about that? Can you tell us about the security and about the rioting that was going on at the time? The primary issue in any kind of environment like that is that you have a tremendous number of people that desperately need care, 
and the resources that are in place and set up to provide them can easily be overwhelmed. So the main concern was to make the hospital be able to function so that it didn't get overrun by all the patients that desperately wanted care. This created a tremendous issue for all the Israeli personnel, and Dr. Ofermerim would have daily meetings with his staff members to deal with the ethical dilemmas that they faced in having to triage and accepting the patients that they could treat, because they could easily be overwhelmed with 300,000 people needing care. So on the one hand, security was there for that, and also just simply being a contingent from Israel who were there with uh, very, very expensive equipment, uh, people that were educated for many different walks of medical sciences, engineering, and logistics, they had to protect these people. Men, women, young people, people all the way into their upper 50s were working there. And I think that they provided a security contingent to protect them. But the primary concern, I believe, was to just properly initiate the introduction of patients into the hospital. We're going to cut for a break soon, but before we do, I just want to tell you we were so proud of the Israelis and what we were watching on television. How did you feel being there? I felt very proud. I went there as an objective journalist, and what I saw were people conducting the finest medical care in the world, basically, with a laboratory set up doing on the spot blood work for patients, complete with centrifuge and refrigerated equipment and their own technicians. I saw a Department of Imaging, which had brought from Israel radiographers and were producing their imagery on computer screens that the doctor could, doctors could observe. I okay, saw. so we're going to come right back, and you'll tell us more about that when we get back. We'll be right back. I'm uh, looking at a, a little booklet that Stand With Us put together of all of your amazing photographs, Joe. Um, and I'm sure that everybody is grateful to you from the State of Israel for the beautiful uh, way that you depicted the people that were working so hard, that were the heroes, the Israeli heroes in Haiti. Um, and I just want to let our audience know that you're, you're able to order this little booklet uh, by going to standwithus.com. And uh, so these are, these are for you to order. But anyways, they're extraordinary, world-class photographs that are really amazing, and I'm sure that we're showing them during this, this uh, show. But I want to ask you, so many things happened there that you were a witness to, that you photographed. I mean, looking at these heart-wrenching pictures, can you think of a, a story that stands out in your mind particularly? I wish I had time to share all of them with you, but I'll share one or two right now. As you know, with any hospital situation, you have both miracles and tragedies and everything in between. There was one child that was brought there orphaned. It was taken care of by a woman who lost her entire family that was a Haitian volunteer, and the child needed a blood transfusion, a whole blood transfusion. And one of the Israeli female paramedics, Mayan Lansman, stepped forward and donated her own blood for this child and worked with the pediatrician, Dr. Yuval Levy, and this woman so hard to keep this child alive. Unfortunately, it passed away, and it was just an amazing experience to watch. On the other side, we had uh, these beautiful miracles where one child uh, came in and was a single surviving uh, member of a triplet birth brought in by Doctors Without Borders, given over to the Israelis to take care of, and his father came every day before and after work to feed him with a syringe, and I had the honor of being able to watch the Israeli doctors help with this tiny child in incubators donated by the JDC and help this child survive its first weeks in this world. And, and we'll assume that that baby made it. We'll assume. I, I hope so, and I have a good feeling about it. But of course, after the 27th, when 27th of January, when operations ceased and all the patients were transferred to other hospitals, that was when my coverage also finished. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of the babies born in the Israeli field hospital? There was one baby that I was uh, witness to that was born, and these two, they were actually being interviewed by a news crew the two obstetricians that were working on the case. And when they were inside delivering the baby, and of course I was waiting outside of the delivery suite, 
I saw these two doctors emerge in absolute jubilation, and they're holding this baby that's completely vibrant and alive and has a very high APGAR score, which is a construct in medicine to tell how healthy a baby is. And they came out with all this happiness because the baby's delivery was very complex. The mother had a prolapsed umbilical cord, which prevented the baby from properly breathing. Its heart rate was extremely low. They were certain that it wasn't going to make it. They worked on it, and it survived. And these two doctors came out just on mm -hmm. fire holding this baby. Wow. And I know that uh, some of the new parents named their babies Israela, or can you tell us about that? Yes, I can. There was this young couple, and they sat around the base watching with such vigilance over their new baby, and just in gratitude to the Israelis and the Israeli physicians and the entire hospital structure, they named their baby Israela after it was delivered there. I mean, it just gives you chills to think about the whole scene there and all of that tragedy, you know, watching new life emerge and this gratitude for the Israelis that were there that, that took their time and, and did so much in such a very, very difficult and tragic situation. Speaking of which, you know, we, we were listening to CNN coverage during the, um, the catastrophe and they kept saying how the Israelis came from so far away and they were able to set up in such a short amount of time and they were the first hospital and all these amazing things about the Israeli field hospital did you know that that kind of coverage was going on while you were there? I had some inkling to it. I was hearing the buzz on the base but I just want to say it was really an outstanding thing to witness a country of seven and a half million people send a contingent of nearly 250 people with 30 tons of equipment and treat 11, over 1,100 patients, conduct 319 successful surgeries, and set up a hospital within just days after such a devastating 7.0 earthquake of January 12th in Port-au-Prince, and to do so within 10 hours. It was just an amazing thing to watch these people doing this balletic dance of their transport crews, their physicians, their logistic people, their cooks, their nurses, their doctors, their paramedics, and their technicians. And to do so all the while when this particular team, which had rehearsed many times in Israel, and the medical director, Dr. Ofer Merim, only one month before had conducted one of his, as a reservist, establishments of such a base on a practice basis, to put this base in Haiti 6,000 miles from home, put their people at substantial risk had anything happened in Israel during that time. Hmm. Wow. You know, this is not the first time, obviously, that Israel has been involved in this kind of rescue. I'm looking at the back of the uh, booklet with your photographs in it, Joe, and I can see that um, Israel has been involved in so many other world, you know, situations, catastrophes, like in Cambodia, in 1979 in Mexico in 1985. Th there's a full list here of incredible dynamic and uh, search and rescue and, and helpful events throughout the history uh, where Israel plays such a, a humanitarian role. When we get back, we'll talk about how Sean Penn visited the, uh, the field hospital and a lot of other great stories that you've come to share with us. We'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back. Today we're talking about Israeli heroes in Haiti, and it's fascinating to hear how the Israelis set up so quickly and how you were there to photograph incredible moments. Joe, uh, one of the things that you told me about before, while the camera was not rolling was about the children and how the Israelis would entertain them and play with them because the situation was so dreadful you know, they, they needed to, to, to help lift up these children's spirits. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. During uh, my stay there, I had a chance to be with the Israelis, not only on the base, but also during infrastructure building activities. When we were in one area, the Maze Gate neighborhood of Port-au-Prince, there were so many children there, all living with their parents, with their families, their extended families in 10 cities. And the Israelis were there 
And during the time that they weren't busy caring for people or rescuing people or doing search and rescue with their dog teams or building infrastructure, they would actually extend themselves to play with the kids and conduct group therapy, which included singing and holding hands and going in circles. And it was just really beautiful to watch how the, the Haitian the Haitian volunteer social workers worked with the Israelis and the Israelis would get down and blow up balloons for the children, draw happy faces on their balloons. The balloons were made out of surgical gloves. Mm -hmm. When the surgical gloves ran out because there were so many children, the soldiers would spontaneously come up with other ideas like taking a marker and drawing a happy face on a children's, uh, children's hand and they were happy about that. And then they invited the the kids to do skits and sing and the kids were so grateful for this attention and it really really showed how when you're in a place that needs aid it's not only the medical aid which is so important and the food but just also the psychological attention and the the caring that is giving to these individual children that they so well responded to that they so well sang and danced in groups and the smiles were something I'll never forget you know, one more thing that, that I remember you told me about when you got back was that the Israelis came prepared even with uh, religious, uh, with the Torah, and so that they were able to celebrate Shabbat. And there was such beauty in that, too. Can you just briefly tell us about that? Yeah, I'd be delighted. The Shabbat celebration was quite something. They had a cafeteria set up that hosted people from many different aid or organizations throughout the world including the uh, members of the United States military and <coughs> the uh, doc, uh, Major General Daniel B. Allen from the 82nd Airborne that came there to tour the base. All these people would come for these dinners and various visits. Uh, there was a rabbi who Israel, the Israelis sent, uh, uh, a rabbi from their military, Rabbi Shaul Ofen, and he brought a Torah and they set up a temple and the Orthodox soldiers and those from the Zaka community who were there that help with collection of body parts uh, when people pass away in circumstances like this would pray three times a day on Saturday and I watched them and I was very moved by the fact that they carried spirituality with them into basically a disaster zone that was so deeply troubled and sought solace from this. Let's uh, talk about something that was uh, not so pleasant and actually very difficult uh, situation. Uh, there was this day that you took a ride out of the Israeli field hospital and you, you took your camera with you and you came upon a scene that was incredible. You want to tell us about that, please? I sure would. Uh, in addition to the wonderful people I met from Israel, including Dr. Ofer Merim, the medical director, and Dr. Itzik Christ, the base commander, I had a chance to meet some wonderful volunteers from all over the world who came to serve on the base. And myself and Dr. Milton Steinman from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Dr. Tanya Tamataro from Brazil as well, and Dr. Ruben Cohen, a maxillofacial surgeon from New York, and myself, we all rented a car to tour Port-au-Prince because we wanted to see what was going on off the base and what had happened to these people. On the Bicentenaire Highway in the hot sun, we came upon a surreal scene that I'll never forget. A young man was on his knees. He had taken a shotgun blast to the arm. He was in severe hemorrhagic shock and moments from death, and his only had shoes and shorts on, and his hands and shirt were bound behind him. So obviously there had been foul play and crime involved. We stopped our car, and in a melee of hundreds of people surrounding this young man, as he fell to the ground, we came and we had no equipment, but we, we wanted to render medical aid. So we took a plastic sheet that the car had to block the windows that were broken out and used that for one doctor to have gloves. There were three pairs of gloves and half a jug of water. That was all the medical care we had with us. And we managed to, to have a volunteer member of the Haitian community who with some difficulty finding him, we finally found him and he provided a truck for us to transport the gentleman back to the base. We took him in, the Israelis admitted him immediately. He was triaged by Dr. Merim and operated on by Dr. Avi Yitzchak and Dr. Gilbert Sabag. His arm was amputated but he survived and three days later he walked out of the hospital 
with, as a gift, a pair of sandals from the husband of one of the nurses from the Jewish General Hospital of Montreal. The gentleman whose identity I concealed because he alleged that it was pr police brutality that resulted in his being injured and his friend murdered actually uh, explained to me that he had a girlfriend in the City Soleil area. We went with uh, two Haitian assistants and found her and brought her back. And as he recovered and was ready to leave the hospital, Sean, the American actor Sean Penn was touring the base and the two of them had a chance to meet. Incredible, incredible stories, one after another, amazing. And I want to thank you so much for being on the show with us and for sharing all of this with us and for your amazing photographs. Again, we've compiled them into one booklet. You can order it online, standwithus.com. And, you know, we're, we're very grateful to you. And Israeli Heroes in Haiti, that's really an appropriate title. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Stand With Us.